Hi everyone and welcome to a new video. This one is about the Dell Inspiron 15 Gaming which I have here. During the video we will have a look at this machine, perform some upgrades like memory and SSD and do some benchmarking and gaming on it. The Inspiron 15 Gaming was released somewhere beginning 2017. The model I have, as far as I could find, was a top model. It came with a Core i7-7700HQ, 16GB of DDR4, 512 gig NVMe SSD, a GeForce 1050 Ti with 4GB and has a 4K screen. Let's have a look at the device before we go a bit deeper in all of that. As you can see, and as expected with those specifications, it is rather bulky, yet nothing over the top. Luckily, at least that's my opinion, Dell stayed modest on the flashy gaming design features. On the left side of the laptop, we have a Kensington lock, power connector, USB port, and SD card reader. The back doesn't have connectors, but is responsible for the airflow. On the right side, we have an audio jack, two more USB ports, HDMI, and network. Opening the device shows us the keyboard, which I'm not really a fan of. It doesn't type very well and, at least with the one I have, you have to press relatively hard on the keys. While typing larger pieces of text, this is fine, but especially for things like entering a password, it can get pretty annoying. The touchpad is comfortable and works ok, nothing more, nothing less. That brings us to the screen, although this example has the most expensive or luxury screen, it doesn't really feel that way. Difficult to explain what exactly is wrong and probably not visible on camera, but it just isn't that regarding image quality. The 4K resolution is great on paper, but conflicts with the lack of power of the GPU. No recent, neither at the time of release, game is or would be playable on the native resolution, as it requires too much power, which is simply not there. Even staying in Windows with tools like DaVinci Resolve, having the resolution on 4K slows down everything too much. So although this looks good in theory, it's a bit of a weird choice. Other than that, the laptop feels decent, it doesn't bend too much and the screen hinge feels pretty sturdy. That brings us to the last side which we didn't see yet, the bottom. Here you can find the air intake and a single screw to open up the laptop. This is really nice, unlike a lot of modern laptops, this one has very easy access to the internals. We can see the battery, the fans which can easily be kept clean this way, Installed memory, one used and one free slot, the NVMe drive and a Wi-Fi card. There is also place for an additional 2.5 inch SATA drive. What is nice to see as well was that Dell decided to ship this device with a single 16GB memory module. This makes it very easy to add another one and upgrade it to 32GB without a too large investment. This is exactly what I will do with the 16GB module which I have here. Simply as that, the laptop now has 32GB, which is also the maximum it can have. I will also add this 512GB SSD. First we need to remove these brackets present in the HDD bay and mount them on the SSD. Before doing so, better to check if the orientation of the drive is correct for the connectors. Then we can fix the brackets to the drive. Connect it. and fix it to the laptop case. That wasn't too difficult, so let's close this up and see if follows the tech. Ah, 
After powering on the laptop, I press F12 to get to the boot options and enter the BIOS setup. The BIOS setup has this typical Dell look, and here we can see that the additional memory was detected and we have 32 gigs in total now. We can also see the additional SSD. The rest of the BIOS has plenty of options and a lot of things can be customized, which is always good to see. Let's boot into Windows and start with some testing. To measure the raw performance, like I usually do, I will begin with Geekbench. Let's start with the CPU and memory performance. The results of the tests which I will run are best to be compared with the HP Elite Test G3, which I reviewed earlier. As that one had an i7-7700, non-HQ, and the GeForce 1050 Ti as well. You can find a card here if you're interested in that video. As you can see, the results are not really in line with that machine. The HP scored roughly 600 points more. This is mainly because the i7-7700HQ, although it has the same number, is clocked quite a lot slower and has less cache than the regular desktop i7-7700. Using that same number feels a bit like a bad marketing trick if you ask me. Now let's test the graphical performance with Geekbench as well. Again, we can compare it with that HP as it had the same card. And here the results are a lot more in line. This makes sense, as there isn't really a difference between the mobile or desktop version of the 1050 Ti. Before we go to the gaming performance, let us test how the SSDs are doing. First up is the NVMe drive. As expected, nice performance here. Then the SATA SSD, which we just added. Not bad either, and in line with the expectations. To get an idea about game performance, after all this is a gaming laptop, let's run 3 Mark. The result is more or less as expected, although a bit on the low side, but what is less good is this graph. We can clearly see that the CPU was clocked back multiple times in order to prevent it from getting too hot. This is not a good sign, especially since this test didn't really take that much time. The i7-7700HQ has a regular clock of 2.8 GHz and a turbo frequency of 3.8. The 3.8 is where it started, and that's exactly as we would expect, but it should, once the turbo budget is exhausted, fall back to the regular clock. Instead, it got clocked a lot lower multiple times. Just to check the impact a bit, I let the laptop cool down properly, then repeated the same test with 3 Mark. As you can see in the graph, it took a lot longer here before performance went down, and that is reflected by the much higher score as well. Let's see how much influence this has in the real game. First up is Microsoft Flight Simulator. I did the same test on the HP Elite Desk as well, and it was pretty playable there with around 30 FPS in average. I put the settings to medium, and to take off a bit of load, turned off the anti-aliasing. We do see that the temperature is already quite high, including a lower clocked CPU speed. Let's see how this goes, but it doesn't look too good. The start is not good, as we see a very low frame rate, which is clearly caused by reduced clock speeds. You can see the CPU constantly fighting to keep temperature under control. This has a very heavy impact on the performance. At some moments we even see the clock speeds and performance really drop low, like here. This allows the CPU to momentarily recover, only to go back to the same behavior. All of this drastically decreases the performance and frame rate up to a level where it's no longer playable. 
Compared with that HP desktop, the difference is really big. Now let's go to another game, GTA 5. This is far from new, but still popular and should be a better match with the specs of this machine. We're starting good and can see that the CPU is at its normal speed, but temperature is increasing fast as you can see. And again, after a small amount of gaming, temperature got too high and everything is going down. The game is still playable, but the frame rate dropped to about half of what it was. Just to prove what I'm talking about, right now we have the CPU throttle, so let's look at the frame rate here. I will now pause and minimize the game and wait for everything to cool down a bit. While we are waiting, as you can see, the temperatures got really high and throttling definitely took place. Now that everything is cooled down a bit, let's resume gameplay. As you can see, the frame rate in the same area here is a lot higher, but we can see the CPU temperature going up slowly. Over 95 degrees Celsius at this point, so it shouldn't take too long before we see throttling again. And there we have it, frame rate dropped a lot and so did the clock speeds. Nevertheless, if we ignore that, the game is definitely still playable, although not really with fantastic performance. As a conclusion, this laptop looks great on paper, but has a few flaws in practice. To my opinion, the screen quality and the lack of possibility to take use of the full potential performance due to cooling are the biggest drawbacks. Despite that, the throttling does work and the laptop's heat dissipation stays under control. It never really feels too hot or too loud. Nevertheless, depending on what you plan to do, this might still be a good choice. Thanks a lot for watching, I really hope you liked the video and if you did, please put a thumbs up. If you like this or similar content, don't hesitate to subscribe to my channel for more of the same. Thanks again and I really hope to see you back here soon.